Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service, providing insider news and knowledge to investors. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Well, it's good to be back, Jim. The cannabis space, all kinds of action every day, incredible amounts of money flowing around, big deals. Uh, what's your feeling and, and what's the latest uh, deal that caught your attention? Well, we saw a fair amount of insider selling uh, late in December, uh, early in the new year, uh, which had us a little, um, uh, you know, caught our attention. Uh, the space actually, you know, obviously has a lot of momentum. So little, uh, so some insider selling is not, uh, you know, particularly surprising. But there was quite a bit, and it leads us to think that we're probably uh, nearing some sort of, at least, consolidation period for the group. Uh, and I think, you know, what what you're seeing is a scramble amongst players, especially the larger ones, to make sure they have the capacity to meet all these expectations that investors have put on them. Um, you know, these stocks have been bid up, and uh, the only way you can make a case for, you know, the current valuations is for uh, not only for these companies to have large capacity, you know, to grow marijuana, but then they're going to be able to sell it all. So those are two big ifs, and uh, right now investors are giving these companies the benefit of the doubt, but that means they actually are going to have to have the um, the capacity to, uh, you know, to, to uh, get product to market. Well, when Washington State legalized pot, Colorado, other states, uh, the biggest thing they found was a lack of supply. Their shelves were emptied in a matter of hours. You know, it'll be interesting to see if that's the case uh, in in pockets in Canada, like British Columbia, where you, I think you, you know, you have a pretty vibrant black market. So we'll see if uh, there's a big shift to the uh, legalized uh, market. Uh, other. Uh, Maybe other jurisdictions, maybe it's a little different. So, you know, we'll have to see how this plays out. It's, um, expectations are quite high. And, uh, you know what, we, uh, today we've seen, uh, uh, Canopy Growth, which is uh, the largest, I believe it's the largest player in the space it used to be, uh, in terms of market cap. Um, it's hard to keep up every day, uh, with what's going on, but, um, they've done a huge bot deal financing, 175 million for plant expansion. And we see other uh, deals in the uh, in the orcs or you know the hostile takeovers uh, and you know in, in attempts to get more capacity. So um, our view right now, though, and we wrote this out to clients on uh, on the week, over the weekend, is that uh, we'd be looking for those uh, companies that are potential takeover plays, uh, those that maybe have a specialty in certain regional markets. As uh, you, I think you'll see some of the bigger players um, trying to ramp up uh, expansion, and you'll have some new players uh, that aren't in the space, uh, you know, try and get in, and uh, maybe you know some local players in various provinces that aren't in the space yet, but uh, might uh, might try and get in by takeover. So, uh, yeah, I think you're looking for uh, for plays now that uh, can take advantage of this cons- consolidation period. Uh, that I think we're about to have, uh, you know, happen uh, in the race to get space. Now, every province has different plans on how they plan to distribute it. Saskatchewan will use private placement. I, I, is BC going to use liquor stores, drug stores? How are they going to do it, or do we know yet? We don't know yet, do we? I mean, uh, uh, I, I believe every uh, BC must be the last province. I mean, because of the election, um, uh, I assume that's put the timetable back. So I think we're waiting. And of course, uh, in BC, there is no lack of uh, access to pot where you have people openly selling it on the streets of downtown Vancouver. Well, this is what will be interesting. You know, will will the uh, black market um, demand demand in the black market shift to the uh, regulated market? We'll have to see. You know, pricing will be a big deal, 
And, um, you know, we'll just have to see. Uh, I, I expect there will be, uh, you know, a, a, an uptick in <laughs> in demand. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, have to see how the pricing is. And, um, and uh, you know, we'll... Uh, We'll all be uh, we'll, we'll all be watching. You know the you know once once we do have uh, marijuana legalized in Canada, which you know I assume is going to be Q3 of this year. So we, we'll get the first reports. Um, we won't get the first reports from the large players. Then you know until October, maybe November. Uh, you know in terms of how um, things went. So um, you know I expect. I mean investors look investors. Uh, Love this space. Maybe they're going to keep bidding it up right until those reports come out. But it wouldn't surprise me here if we see a little bit of um, of a cooling off, and maybe we'll get another run, um, you know, into legalization day. Um, and a lot will depend, I think, uh, as we also wrote about, uh, you know, what interest rates do. Uh, if we do see a major move in the bond market, bond yields move up, that could take some steam out of out of the um, the more growthy speculative areas uh, but right now uh, you know with a 10 year US treasury yield of 2.6% and the government of Canada 2.2% it's probably not enough to take the take the speculative juices out of this market but uh, prices have gone pretty high um, in the last uh, few months and uh, probably due for a little bit of a uh, breather we'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, the Bank of Canada boosting its trend-setting rate by a quarter of a percent. The commercial banks immediately boosting their mortgage rates. The Royal Bank, which is either the biggest or the most hated bank in Canada, depending on whose opinion you take, uh, they boosted their mortgage rates last week. They didn't even wait for the Bank of Canada. We also have Stephen Polos, the governor of the Bank of Canada, saying, our economy is 50% more vulnerable to higher rates due to high consumer debt. Well, if we're so vulnerable, why did they hike rates in the first place? Well, uh, why did it take him so long to uh, uh, figure this out? Uh, I mean, he's been the one who's been encouraging people to, uh, to uh, uh, pile into this debt. I mean, uh, that's, what, that's what you do when you're the central bank and, and you cut interest rates to basically, you know, near zero, um, you're telling people to load up on debt and then, you know, to come back and say, oh, well, you know, gee, uh, uh, we're now we're more vulnerable to debt. Well, hello. Uh, yes. Uh, did you just figure this out now? <laughs> you know, like, what's, uh, what's the big surprise here? No, he had to raise rates because uh, he has an inflation target, which he's met, and the economy's uh, firing on, you know, basically all cylinders now. You know, as I know, there, you'll, there's always pockets that aren't firing, you know, totally, but uh, on balance, the economy is doing pretty well. Inflation is at its target. What are you going to do? What, what more do you need to, to try and get rates back to normal? You know, now, um, I think that uh, uh, what uh, he's uh, also going to do is back off here until the NAFTA negotiations uh, get a little bit further down the road, and that does make some sense. You know, why would you keep uh, hiking rates um, when your uh, ma- biggest trading partner is making all sorts of unpredictable noises and unreasonable demands and threatening to, you know, uh, pull, you know, pull out of the, this major trade agreement. Uh, you know, there's no sense in, in going full blast and raising interest rates and, you know, and, and talking and, and, you know, and letting your currency, you know, keep going higher and higher, <clears throat> um, which, by the way, I think Canadian dollar is probably going to keep 
going higher, but um, why would you uh, kind of throw fuel on the fire for that when you've got it? Your major trading partner is really engaging in what one has, one can only characterize as bad behavior at the negotiating table. Uh, you know, you just can't ignore that. You've got to, you've got to play, you got to, you got to deal with that reality. And so far, I think Canada is doing a pretty good job um, dealing with um, this uh, a belligerent uh, trading partner they've got down south. Um, you know, I think. Uh, I think Canada has had a pretty good uh, start to the new year on the NAFTA side, and but you know it's early, it's early in the new year, and uh, uh, we're a long way away from uh, doing any victory laps. That's for sure. Well, the Americans uh, clearly hate Canadian products. Three hundred percent duties on Canadian aircraft, ten percent on Canadian newsprint, twenty five percent on Canadian softwood. It looks like if it's made in Canada, the U.S. definitely doesn't want it. Well, I think it's a broader uh, problem. Uh, if it's made anywhere outside of the United States, the U.S. The US administration doesn't want it. The only problem with that is it, it pushes up inflation in their uh, to their consumers. If you look at what's happened in the lumber market, it's just well, you know uh, a textbook case of what can go wrong when you uh, pursue these protectionist policies. I mean, lumber uh, last time I checked is now you know uh, four hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, the futures contracts. We, you know, these are multi-year highs. Basically, the the burden has shifted from the Canadian forestry product companies to the U.S. consumer, and so you know, bravo! If that's the outcome you uh, wanted, uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, congratulate yourself in a tweet because uh, you've just uh, made uh, life more expensive for your for your citizens, and uh, you know, th- there you go. Well, uh, I mean, America does have the worst weather in the world: tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. Fires to rebuild Florida, Costa Rica, or Puerto Rico, I'm sorry, and California now after their mudslides is going to cost them a fortune because of the softwood lumber duties. Do they understand that it's also cost them jobs because American home builders say they can't afford to hire workers anymore? Well, we will, we will see. I mean, we did see the, the uh, U.S. president back off uh, late last week. Um, Midweek, Canada launched a massive uh, trade complaint with the, at the World Trade Organization about against the United States about how it determines duties, such as on things like softwood lumber and newsprint and, and airplanes. Um, and it also looked at other uh, examples for other countries that the U.S. has uh, gone after. So this is a this was a very astute tactic by the Canadian government. And, uh, it really, because it really ups the ante, uh, the, the Americans love their system, uh, they wanted to strengthen it at NAFTA, and the Canadians have basically said, okay, uh, if that's your game, we can play that game too, and, uh, off we're gonna go to the World Trade Organization. So, uh, this is, uh, this is, you know, uh, was, was, was a bold move, uh, some Americans didn't like it, which I think is probably, just tells you how effective it was. And uh, lo and behold, by the end of the week, you had the president backing off a bit on his, I'm going to rip up NAFTA. Um, so were the two related? Not hard to say, uh, but uh, let's just say it was a good week for Canada last week. And hopefully we'll have uh, more of those. Um, you know, I mean, we want, uh, an, obviously, we have to be realistic. It's going to be an agreement where not everyone gets everything they want. Usually that's how it works. Uh, but... Uh, um, you know, we're a long way, obviously, from a deal, but uh, last week was a good week for, for the Canadian side. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, the cryptocurrency space has been just a, a confusing meltdown over the last few days. 
What is happening there, and what do you tell people when you discuss things like Bitcoin? Well, we had a blow off uh, in in the space. Uh, prices just got ridiculously uh, out of control. Um, and, you know, this is vulnerable to a pullback, and I, you know, I think it probably um, just uh, foreshadows maybe what we're going to see in the stock market at some point uh, if if the U.S. if U.S. equities keep rallying here. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think you, you have to be uh, focused on the fundamentals. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you're going to be investing in a cryptocurrency or a, st- a stock that is tied to the cryptocurrency space, you, you, you've got to believe in what they're doing and what the underlying value of that currency is. So, you know, for example, with Bitcoin, uh, it's... Uh, the, you know, it was the first one out of the gate, so it's got the most brand recognition, but, you know, it's got a lot of problems. It's, you know, it, it's very cumbersome to transact in, and there have been a lot of competitors uh, that have um, emerged that are doing a better job than Bitcoin. So, you know, uh, the, the space is still dominated by uh, or influenced by a lot of speculative investors, um, a lot of new new time newcomers. Uh, we did a, a survey, at, and you can go to CanadianInsider.com and you know and look at the survey of our community, uh, which is I would say you know more established traditional equity focused uh, investing community. Um, and you know uh, a small group of them have exposure um, to, uh, to to cryptocurrencies, but most don't. And the ones that don't, most of them won't want to find out more before they act. And there's a big group of them that just don't trust uh, cryptocurrencies. So, you know, I think those companies playing in the space, uh, those exchanges that have popped up, if they, you know, if they really want to build uh, strong relationships with new investors uh, and seasoned investors, they're, they're going to have to spend some time building those uh, relationships through education and earning their trust. So I think that's the next phase in this space. You know, we've had the sort of speculative blow off, but I don't think by any means uh, the technology is dead. And uh, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of strong um, applications uh, for both the blockchain technology and the use of cryptocurrencies. But it's it, we're in we're in the process of getting it all. Sort of sorted out and, and cutting away a, a, a lot of the speculative froth, a froth which is a, a good thing. What about more traditional things like gold and silver? Well, you know, I think what what you're going to see now is uh, an, a, a recognition that uh, you know gold, uh, for example, is a, a is a more stable alternative uh, <clears throat> to some of these cryptocurrencies um, with respect to um, you know hedging uh, your exposure to the um, uh, you know, to fiat currencies. So, uh, you know, gold will uh, attract a bit more attention. Uh, but, you know, gold, I think, in, in this race, it's the tortoise and the hare. And, uh, um, you know, gold will sort of steady as she goes. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to win the race, but it's certainly going to uh, eventually give the hare uh, a good run for its money. BC Premier John Horgan has a trip off to Asia next week. What should he be promoting in Asia and where do you think he might stumble? Well, you know what? I don't know why he's going to Asia at this point. You know, they haven't done a budget, and uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I just don't think that's the kind of thing that British Columbians uh, really have at the top of their list. Uh, yes, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, our links to Asia are very important. Um, but look, this is the premier who's trying to stop uh, the. Um, Kinder Morgan expansion, um, you know, uh, there's uncertainty uh, with respect to what their first budget's going to be. You know, I, 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 I just don't know why he'd be going now. Now, when I talked to Stuart Muir from the Resource Work Society, he just chatted with John Horgan yesterday and said, you know, the premier isn't against liquefied natural gas projects because Asia really is demanding it. And perhaps he'll really, uh, you know, make an effort to try to promote that again. Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, again, you know, I think he's got work to do at home, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I mean, it, it's good that he, I guess, uh, that he's interested in promoting British Columbia 
as a as a, as a trading partner, uh, you know, and, and from that, I guess it's a positive sign. Uh, but you know, when he, uh, I think, still has to establish his credentials as a as a business friendly. I don't know, if friendly is the right word, but not anti business. He hasn't yet established his credentials in in policy on that so it's premature for him to go to asia he should be staying home and then go to asia after his budget that'd be my take on it but look you know good luck to him uh he's premier and uh hopefully he'll um he'll uh you know in uh instill uh, confidence amongst the business leaders in asia uh about the opportunities in british columbia home ownership consultant ross k has told me or and has told our audience that if you want more affordable housing in the Lower Mainland, build rapid transit out to the areas where housing is more affordable. You know, housing affordability uh, in both uh, Vancouver and Toronto is uh, it's going to take a, a multi uh, a multifaceted solution here. I don't think there's any one silver bullet. Um, I think. The big driver will be when global bond rates move up, then housing will become more affordable in price. Okay, um, but yes, there there are a lot of other factors that can be done, uh, and uh, you know, I would uh, I would think that uh, the BC government is going to come up with some sort of reforms to the tax system that I would hope uh, uh, address the situation because right now. You've got. Uh, I know people in people in, in in Vancouver don't believe this, but they are one of the lowest tax lowest property tax jurisdictions in North America, and and that would that's fine when you're a, a, a closed economy and you, you know. But 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 when other foreign uh, buyers and speculators see this, it's an invitation for them to bid up uh, property prices because they don't have to pay a lot in holding costs, i.e., taxes, right? So, uh, when you're a speculator, one of the things one of the things you take into account is how much is it going to cost for me to hold this property? And if it's a bargain basement uh, property tax compared to uh, like Seattle, for example, where property taxes are three times the, the cost uh, of Vancouver at least. And yes, there's, yes, I know there's all sorts of different factors. It's not apples and oranges, but from a from a foreign buyer's perspective in, or speculator. They're looking at the holding costs of these homes, and uh, property taxes in Vancouver are dirt cheap. So what you've got to do is, at least for for speculators and people who don't live here, uh, don't work here, you've got to increase the holding costs for them if they're going to speculate in properties. I think that's coming. I, I hope that's coming, and, and I would put that ahead of just about any other initiative right now uh, on on the policy side. Yes, it would be great to have rapid transit. It's expensive. But, hey, you know, we've got this infrastructure plan. Let's get on with it. Uh, that can be part of the solution for sure. In other words, uh, a foreign owner tax, not a foreign buyer tax. Uh, uh, more, more or less, more of a, of a speculative um, uh, buyer's tax. You know, it doesn't matter whether you really whether you're a foreign buyer or you're from, you know, another province, right? If you're If you're just speculating on B.C., Housing, Vancouver housing, no matter where you're from, right? Even if you're a local speculator and you own 10 properties and you're just flipping them around, um, why, uh, why should, why should the tax system essentially be subsidizing that by ultra low property taxes? Um, you know, property taxes are, to keep them low are fine, uh, in a broader scheme of things for people who work and live here and contribute to the overall economy, but, uh, again, you also have to understand that these property taxes are also uh, holding costs for speculators, and when they're too low, it invites uh, speculators to use uh, housing as a uh, speculative vehicle. Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, his website, CanadianInsider.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show and our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. 
comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.